Hello and welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Sean Lay. Is it safe to do business in the United Arab Emirates? David Haig thought so until he endured a 22-month nightmare imprisonment during which he says he was violently assaulted. His former employer says he's a convicted fraudster. Mr Haig says he's the victim of legal, economic and political malfeasance. Is there something rotten in the state? David, hey, welcome to Hard Talk. Let's pick up your story in May 2014. You were working for GFH, a company which was based in Dubai and which you had helped to buy Leeds United Football Club, where you had been the managing director. Why were you flying to Dubai at this point? Well, I'd been the managing director of Leeds um, and while there I had put together a consortium to purchase Leeds United from, from my former employees, GFH, um, and that consortium fell apart um, and it was sold to uh, the, the then owner, Massimo Chalida, who's now also a previous owner. Um, and I had then resigned from Leeds United and had various legal disputes with my former employer. Um, there were various legal actions that had been started by my side against them in, in England. So things were getting a bit ugly. Things were getting a bit ugly. We had fallen out. Um, and they then started a, you know, kind of a long, long track of trying to get me to come. First to Bahrain um, and then to Dubai. This was text messages, emails, come here, we'll sort it out. Yeah. You know, we're, we're all friends here. There's no need to go to the courts, etc. So, you know, I obviously believed them. Um, as you do, because you had no particular reason yes. not to. Did anyone um, voice any unease to you? Did anyone say, mm, why, why do they want you to come out? What's going on? Why not just come out to you here? Yeah, I mean, I'd lived in Dubai for eight years. Um, and so for me, it was a second home. So there was no, I mean, I, at that point, I actually hadn't been in Dubai for nine months because Leeds had been so... that so, so All consuming. Yeah, all consuming for those nine months. So to me, there was nothing, you know, I hadn't done anything wrong. I didn't even yeah. think of it. And certainly if you had done something wrong, a Middle Eastern country is not one that you would fly out to. Sure. No, so to answer your question, yes, um, Ken Bates, I had uh, dinner with Ken. Uh, the he was the former owner of Leeds. The former owner of yep. Leeds and Chelsea. Probably better known for Chelsea. Yeah, yeah Ken. And um, I had dinner with him and he didn't get on with the, the, the people he sold the club to at all. He's been very vocal <laughs> about what he thinks of them. And um, so that, that, that fell apart. And um, I had dinner with him and his wife, Susanna, and he said in his very gruff voice, don't go, it's a trap. <laughs> And I, I, because this is one of the conversations, I mean, I laugh about it now, yes. but it is very serious yes. because you, you know, the only, you've got to look at something like that that happens to you, you know, with some kind of comedy because otherwise it just gets very yeah. dark. But at the time you didn't take it seriously, you kind of laughed it off. Well, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, okay. because obviously Ken, has, Ken, was, uh, Ken had sold the club to yeah. them and then they had found reasons to fire Ken and, mm. and, and, and um, cause him problems, so, so he didn't so, like them. So there you go, yeah. you, you get on the plane, you, yeah. you fly to Dubai, you arrive in Dubai, um, what happened when you reached the company's office? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, ironically, they, they, yeah, I have a first-class ticket. So I go from a first-class ticket um, sitting in, you know, the, the Emirates, um, you know, nice big airline <laughs> yes. with, with, with you know, in the suite and everything. Go to my home, spend an hour freshen up, go to the office. I was supposed to be meeting, you know, 70-year-old ex-UAE government minister who had just joined the board of the company, who was, you know, going to settle all the disputes right. that we had, pay me all the money yep. they owed me, etc. This is what I'd been told. Mm. Um, and in walks a young gentleman, probably about 18 or 19, uh, wearing a Kandora, which is the local dress, yes. with a cap on back to front. So I'm thinking, well, this is not the 70-year-old <laughs> ex-minister. Ex and, um, you know, he then just looked at me and said, come with me. So um, this is this 18 or 19-year-old yeah, lad yeah. is a police officer? Yeah, it would appear so, yeah. Um, and, I mean, never actually, you know, other than the same police, never said the word rest, nothing like that, just said, come with me. Um, you know, and I'd lived in Dubai long enough to know that, you know, a little thing like, for instance, a car accident yes. or you forgot to pay your phone mm -hmm. bill or something like that can mean that the police get involved. And, yeah, so basically, to cut a long story short, go to the police station. Um, it's not like you would Im imagine, uh, you know, it's not, not a nice place. Very loud, very hot, very busy, lots of people shouting, police have all got guns. You start um, to get quite uneasy at this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't spent time in police stations, and let alone an, an, an Arabic one in the Middle East. And it's not like the Dubai that you see on the TV. This is kind of the real Middle East. You know, yes. it's, it's an old police station, lots of screaming, lots of shouting, people being pushed around. And, um, and you know, I was put in a chair. Um, 
And again, you know, time passes, time passes, time passes, till ultimately um, another person comes in and says that, quite simply, you've been accused of taking money um, from your employer. Where's the money? Yes. So this is, this is yep. the point. So before the end of this first day, yep. you find out this is what it was about. Yep. Right. So that, but that was literally it. You've been accused of taking money from your employer. Where's the money? So not, not have you, did no, you... No detail just, about what we're talking where's about. Where's the money? Okay, fine. So I looked at them. Yeah. So how long does this process take before you finally are formally charged? How long before you actually are charged with an offence? 15 months. 15 months. Yeah. And during that 15 months, yeah. where are you? I'm in a, uh, what's called Burdabai Police Station, which is a temporary detention facility. It's supposed to keep people there a couple of weeks maximum. So they're cells? Yeah, right. a couple of weeks. I was there 15 months. During that 15 months, no investigation. There was no questioning of me. There was questioning on the first day. Um, and then the morning after the first day, and then that was it, nothing, until 15 months later. So no questioning, no investigation, rarely, I mean, any kind of resemblance that you would have of a normal system where if you're accused of something, you, yes. you get the right to see your lawyer, translate, none of that. You, know, you never expect to have to go through something like this. So obviously when it happened to me, my friends and my family contacted the British Embassy. They came, I think, after the second or the third day. Um, and, you know, being probably somewhat a naive Brit um, and having lived abroad for most of my life, I expected them to come in probably rather foolishly, something like James Bond-esque, um, and, and sort this out. Because, you know, yeah. I'm sitting in a country, yeah. I've been set up, nothing, well, yeah. you know, I'm appalled what's happened. I was lured out there um, and made same things in Arabic. And the first thing they said to me, this was the vice consul, said to me, um, well, the best we can do is move you to a different jail um, because you're likely to be here for two years until they actually investigate and decide if they're going to charge you. That must have been a hell of a shock. Not, we're going to get you out. Not, we're going to make sure you've got a good trial. We're going to, th that. And that was, like you said, a hell of a shock. You know, and, and I actually remember saying at the time, I looked at the gentleman and I said, well, you're certainly not James Bond. And I said to the lady, you're not Miss Moneypenny, which was probably a very foolish thing to say. <laughs> but I, I mean, again, I laugh about it now. But I mean, that, you know, something that I now, from the campaigning work that I do in helping other Brits there, is regular. You know, they tell yeah. you this and they tell you not to contact the media. Foreign Office says that its staff were in almost daily contact with you throughout your detention. Yeah, you see, that, that, I mean, that's, that, that's a lie, basically. You know, they, at the beginning, um, I was, you know, my, myself, my family, um, you know, politicians on my behalf were pushing them, pushing them, pushing them, because it was just so ridiculous. But then when I realised that I wasn't getting anywhere, I just stopped, because you have very limited access to the phone, very limited. You would have one phone, sometimes between mm. 60, 150 people. You were in custody throughout this period. Um, you were quoted in, a, in an interview you gave to the Daily Mail newspaper saying that you started scribbling things down on torn out pages of a copy of The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But they allow me to have pens and paper now. In fairness to the guards, they've been very good to me. Yeah. Was that the whole story? No. I mean, that, that interview that I gave, basically, I mean, a lot of what was happening was that I was told at the beginning by the embassy, by the foreign office, and I was told by some of the guards and my lawyers, say nice things about Dubai. Play along. Play along, be good, tell everyone how great the guards are. So if you look at my Twitter account from that time, yes. you, know, uh, you know, people on my behalf were running it outside of my website. There was all this lovely stuff about the guards. You know, we yeah. even got my lawyers to write them a nice yeah. ticket to put on their wall. This was all nonsense. This was not what was happening. The reality of what was happening was what I was telling the embassy on a contemporaneous basis, you know, and what I was writing to, there's a court in Dubai called the DIFC, and it's where some retired English judges go. And in 2015, 2016, I was writing them letters saying, I'm being tortured, I'm being abused, help, basically, let's, longer than that. Let's um, roll back, if we may, and I, I realise a lot of this is not very pleasant to go back over, mm. but we have to be clear about what it is you were saying happened yep. to you. When you say you were tortured, what, specifically, what do you mean? And on, I mean, abused in general over the, the 22 months. And, and when I say abused in general, I mean, I, I say like, you know, punches and kicks and bangs over the head with sticks and things like that. In terms of torture, I see to myself three distinct episodes. One was on the first day, um, one was a couple of weeks later, and one was a couple of weeks after that, two, two or three weeks after that. And they all followed the same kind of format, which is a format which I now know they use on other people, which was basically being multiply tasered um, beaten around the head and the back um, and the legs and kicked on the floor, stamped on. Uh, I mean, just basically severely beaten up, 
Um, but the tasering was one of the worst things because it was, you know, not once, it was again and again repeated. and again. Repeated tasers, you know, by repeated people. And when, when you're on the, for, on the floor, you know, kicking you and, and electrocution and with the tasers. And so that was, you know, a format that I would see again and again and again. So it wasn't, you know, so like... So you saw it done to other prisoners and you experienced it to yourself. I, I saw that and worse done to other prisoners, which, you know, as I've said many times, that's to me was the worst thing because, you know, someone punches you in the face... You, it's not great, but in a way you get a little bit used to it. You know, it's not something that, you know, obviously being a lawyer and, and, and that, being a businessman in the career that I had, it's not something I was used to at all, but you can deal with it. But one of the things that I think after the first maybe three months, when they realised, when they, the police, realised that, you know, I was a little bit well known in England um, and, oh dear, what have they done? Um, they then start being nice in general, some were still unnice. Now, as part of that, they would take me out of the main area and let me sometimes sit with the guards and let my lawyers see me for a little bit longer time. And when I would sit in the guard staff room, I would see a lot, you know, and I would see them regularly beat. And, and, and I use the word torture really severely here because... And, we should say that we have made repeated attempts to approach the authorities in the UAE to ask for comment on your case, and we've had no response at all from them. And obviously, therefore, we've had no opportunity to put any of these yeah. specific allegations to them. You're gay. Yeah. Did that make you feel additionally vulnerable because you were in a country where being gay and, and having a homosexual relationship would be an offence? Yeah, it did. I mean, I'm, I'm going to come to that on in, cool. a, in a moment, but there's one thing that I wanted to pick up when you said that they, the, the, the UAE haven't, haven't come back to you. I, since I mm. have come back, one of the things that I do, I'm often a defence witness for um, extraditions. So when the UAE, because there's an extradition treaty between the UAE and the UK still. And you've um, set up this group called Do Justice, which is to, to provide help for people yeah. who find themselves in the situation you, you've been exactly. in, in Dubai, yeah. in the UAE, and need help, whether it's financial, legal, or whatever, or representation. Yeah, precisely. Okay. So I do a lot of, I, I've done probably about 10 yeah. um, court cases, a recent one in Scotland, where I'm an evidence that for the so what that means is I put my statement in, what happened to me? Now, recently in a case in England, the UAE accepted my evidence. They, they did not challenge the evidence that I had given, you know, before the court. They didn't say it was true, but you're saying they didn't they challenge chose it. Not and to because challenge they it. chose not to challenge it, you would argue that they're accepting it. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I mean, the lawyers, the, the barristers that ran that case said that because it's, they've chosen not to charge it and cross-examine me. So th th I just want to put that in. Of because course. Now, going back to um, what you said about being gay. Now, this, for me, is one of the reasons why I felt I started to fall out with my former employer. Because when I was at Leeds, um, the deal for my consortium to purchase lead was signed in November 2013. And in December 2013, I um, uh, made the club the, one of the first football diversity champions for Stonewall. So Which is, a, a, for those who don't know, is a gay charity, a gay charity based in the yeah. UK. Yeah. So we, we had a day when Robbie Rogers, who was one of the leaders' former players, came along and he launched his um, uh, charity called Beyond It. He came um, and also did Stonewall. And so it was a very popular day. Leeds fans were fantastic. You know, Robbie got a standing ovation for, for all the work he's done. And he's gone on to do great things, obviously, very, doing very well at LA Galaxy. Um, and I'm told that that was one of the days that, that really upset. And it was probably foolish of me. They were an Islamic bank. I perhaps shouldn't have done that. But as far as we were concerned, we were purchasing the club. And I, and I now know that that was one of the reasons, because I've been told by people still involved in the group, e even now, that one of the reasons why... I had angered okay. them so much yes. is because I was gay. So one of the things that they did with that information is that I had my legal team tried to launch a private prosecution in the UK, um, and I gave a lot of evidence in that. That evidence was translated into Arabic, talked about my sexuality, talked about what was being done to me, the conditions, translated by them into Arabic, brought to the police station, given to the guards, and they were told that you know he's gay, um, you know and. It was in some of the times when I was being, two of the occasions when I was being tortured, and you know, it was used as a reason, and that I was being hit, and that I was being beaten, and one of the because you were gay, because I was gay, um, and I was sexually abused. You know, I had, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but you know, I had Coca-Cola bottles placed in places that you know they, they shouldn't be placed in, and in addition to that, obviously, because it came in the newspapers and the guards talked to the, the police, and uh, sorry, the guards talked to the prisoners, the prisoners began to know, you know, so I then had difficulties in the jail because, again, the majority of the people there were from the region. They were not expats, so that, that caused me great difficulties. What it also meant is that I couldn't have my partner obviously come and visit me. He's from the Middle East, but he couldn't come and visit me. And one of the things that then became very important for that for me is that 
I had asked the court in Dubai, the English, you know, the DIFC court, which is the financial court with English judges, I'd said, can you not have my hearings in public that discuss my partner? Because it puts us at risk. The English courts had granted us that. The Dubai court said no. And not only did they say no, they then put it on YouTube. You know, so there was a YouTube Arabic court, you know, hearing about basically about discussing all the details, yeah, which yeah. was caused me so many problems. Let me uh, move on to to the the court case when it finally happened. Yeah, uh, and there's obviously a long process involved here, but we get to uh, November 2016, hmm. uh, so well over two years after hmm. you were first detained. And at the Dubai International Financial Centre, the Commercial Court, uh, Justice Roger Giles rules in November 2016 that you had acted dishonestly in misappropriating money from the claimant, your employer. Uh, he found that the sum of uh, a significant sum of uh, derm, the Arab Emirates money, plus 50,000 US dollars, plus more than two million pounds of UK money had been received by you and were held by you on trust for the claimant. So in, effectively, he found that you were a fraudster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, to say that that is, a, you know, a farce of a trial, to give, you, to, to give you an idea of what happened. So up until September this year, I'd never once been allowed to appear in court. Yeah. Not once. Every opportunity was taken to stop me having lawyers. So it was a part of a comprehensive disablement. So lock me up, shut me up, stop my access to lawyers. And then when I did have my access to lawyers, stop my access to money to pay the lawyers. But the obvious question is why? Why bother? Well, Without any yeah, disrespect yeah. to you, why are you on. so important yeah. no, that they would go to all this yeah. to try and give you such bad treatment? Well, I'll come on to that in a minute, um, because it's not just me they've done it to, it's several other people. But back to the judgment of, 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 of the, the DIC court. Now, I, when I came back, I spent five and a half months in hospital. And you were very, I was always, even though I absolutely do not respect the court whatsoever, and you know, it's wholly corrupt as far as I'm concerned, still I'm engaging with it as a lawyer. I'm trying to be respectful mm. engaging with it. Now, we told them that I was going to hospital. Whilst I was going to hospital, they decided to hold the hearing whilst I was in hospital. I had lawyers that were trying to come on the record, so they were trying to become a regulated lawyer in, in, in the UAE so they could represent me, English lawyers. They ignored them. So there was a deliberate attempt by the DIFC to stop me going to that hearing, to stop me having lawyers. Now, ultimately what happened is that we appealed when, when I came out of hospital. And four weeks uh, in September, mid-September, we've won that appeal. So that judgment has now been set aside. But it now goes back, back to the court to right reconsider. To yeah, yeah, right to the beginning now. So, so it's not a necessarily an exoneration, but it's not a conviction. You are now back in the legal process yeah, once again. Yeah, back at the beginning. Can I, though, put you what, um, what uh, uh, Justice Charles also said in, in, in the rest of his judgment? He said that you had sought to defend the claim against you with explanations which I, Justice Charles, considered to be lacking in credibility and a concoction. And he then accused you of spraying legal actions left, right mm. and centre, apparently to distract, he claimed, from the central charge. The defendant brought applications and appeals with marked paucity of success and diversionary and collateral proceedings while not engaging with the application for immediate judgment. In my opinion, his dishonest conduct mm. and his conduct in relation to the claim brought against him was inappropriate and unreasonable to the level of taking the case out of the norm and warranting an order for costs on the indemnity basis. In other words, yep. he said that you had made a farce of this process yep. and that he was effectively fining you in addition to ordering you to return the sums which he claimed that you had yep. stolen from your yep. employer. There's two questions. There's the first one that you wanted me to ask about why me and then there's the, this question now. So I'll deal with that and then Do. I'll talk and about the why, we'll me. About why so, me. So again, this judgment, you know, this judgment was from a court and a judge who had not let me go to court at all, ever. They had not let me file a full defence. They had not let me file a counterclaim. They had not let me file my evidence, of which there is a lot. They had essentially not let me do anything. Which raises the other question that we were going to deal with, which is why you? Yeah. So, as I said, back to the judgment, it's wiped away, it's yep. not there. Okay. It was a judgment from a hearing which I didn't take part in at all and there was no defence. So of course he's going to come to those conclusions mm. when there is no defence. Why was there no defence? Because of what had happened to me, basically. Now, back to the point, why me? Now, like I, like I said right at the beginning, I had become, I, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, mm. but because of the lead deal that was starting to collapse, hadn't gone very well, I'd become a bit of a problem. And my side and my consortium had filed legal actions against the club, but more importantly against GFH. The, the new purchaser of Leeds, Massimo Cellino, immediately after he purchased the, the, the club, he was planning on making a, a breach of contract claim himself against my ex-employers. And I was obviously, of course, the star witness because he believed that they, he had been tricked into buying the club. 
and hadn't been told various different things about it. So all of a sudden, I became this very important person. So and actually, you become financially very significant. Very significant. To, because if they lose on his claim, yes. then it costs them a lot of money. Well, they would so have gone better to discredit you, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, I mean, they would have gone right. bankrupt. Okay. Because a, a so effectively, what you're saying is this was a process to discredit you yeah. so that you could not be a witness in, in those claims. <laughs> the only um, on-the-record statement we have from GFH that has been made at all was made to the Yorkshire Evening Post. So you will have seen this, and it was back in April 2016. Uh, and they were asked to respond to um, what was known about your case you know, then. And they said simply this, what this case is actually about is his embezzlement to GFH his funds for his own benefit. He is a convicted fraudster and is subject to freezing injunctions which he has never applied to have set aside. Is yeah. that true? No, no. There are applications in the UK. So there's applications. And again, we go back to, if you go back to the, the, the right at the beginning, had I, it had my former employees believed I'd done something wrong, report me to the police in England. Go about the normal process. Why do you have to fly me to the Middle East to put me into a system that is known to be corrupt? You know, that's accepted by our own courts in England because extradition since 2011 will not extradite a British person mm. to the UA mm. because they say, in their own words, there's a real risk of torture and unfair trials. You know, that statement itself is actually incorrect because we did make, even at that time, applications okay. to set these aside. And currently, in England, there's a part heard application to set those freezing orders aside. What sort of condition was David Haig in when he got off the plane in the UK after that? quite indescribable experience. Yeah, I mean, and not a good one. I mean, I had lost 60 kilos, um, I think 59 kilos in, in weight, um, and, um, you know, broken everything pretty much. I mean, you know, even now, I mean, my, my teeth are hurting as we speak because, you know, they were smashed up. So, you know, I spent five months in hospital. Now, my knee was damaged. I've had to have surgery on my knee, my foot, my hand, my cheek has been fractured. Um, I've got post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I've spent five months as an inpatient in hospital um, and an awful lot of time as an outpatient. You know, I've been to, I, I go to regular rape counselling. Um, I was not well and um, I... You still have nightmares about what you went through? It's more, rather than a nightmare, it's more flashback. So, you know, I can be, for instance, if I'm sitting here talking to you and not that I would, but if I drifted away, at, at that point, you get like these when your guard of, is down yeah more like day you know flashbacks in the day um and i was getting a lot so and anything that would do with the middle east could set them off so it could be a smell or it could be hearing someone speak arabic on the tv and you know all these nightmares would bring that back and it was it was debilitating um and i, I got home in march and i was in hospital i think in the priory in london in june i think i went to hospital i was there for two months um and then i came out um, and I was on an awful lot of medication. And I remember my GP at one point, I mean, I was on morphine, liquid morphine, which gives you an idea of the pain. So I was on morphine, I think, for about 15, 16 months. Um, so that gives you an idea of the level of pain that I was in. But the more stories like yours are told, mm -hmm. uh, not just here, but perhaps more importantly, in the UAE, in the Middle East more generally, the more they're disseminated on social media in a way that's much harder to control than conventional media, doesn't there come a point where it actually damages the country's interests and therefore it will be in their interest to change that. Yes, yeah, I think it does and I think it's, you know, I think it's, you know, certainly when I came out and I set up the charity with a, a partner of mine, Rada Sterling, who had worked on cases like mine before, um, you know, like I said, we have a charity, Due Justice and Danger by when we set that up, you know, one of the things that we want to do, as well as helping people there, is to raise the profile so we can say, you know, Dubai, you can change this. You know, there is no reason to abuse and torture and have unfair trials. I mean, it might benefit you in the short term in terms of your local businesses and your so, local families. Sorry. So you're an optimist, yep. but you're still very angry. I'm very angry from my side, but I'm an optimist. And to be honest, I would like to go there and help them change it. Thank you very much for being with us on Hard Talk, David Haig. It's a great pleasure to meet pleasure. you. Thank you. Thank you.